And I thought today, as we uh, are thinking about those things, you know, when you think about counting the Omer, when you read it in the Bible, as uh, Claire actually was uh, talking about uh, last uh, Shabbat, that they were bringing an Omer, the sheep of the first fruits, right? Uh, that they would they would come to God with agriculture, with with the produce of the land. And it is really very interesting because uh, the produce of the land I, I represented, you know, the blessing of God on the people. And it's, uh, it's quite interesting, the relationship of uh, the land to blessing to the people, the land, God, and Israel, you know, like a triangle. The land, God, and Israel. Now, it uh, all kind of uh, worked uh, uh, together, either for better or for worse. Uh, and uh, and so in this week's Torah portion, uh, there's a great passage about it. So I thought that this week, as we come just before Shavuot, uh, we would uh, talk about, we might say, God's vision for this world. God's vision for this world. And in the 26th chapter, of uh, uh, Leviticus. This week's Torah portion is chapter 25 and 26. We'll be in our uh, Torah study today. We'll be talking about uh, both chapter 25 and 26. Chapter 25 is all about the, you know, uh, the uh, kinsman redeemer and the year of jubilee and and all of uh, and all of that. And the reason we picked, by the way, that passage in Matthew 18 to read as the Brit Hadashah portion is that Yeshua on many occasions used the Torah portions that talked about what we have in chapter 25 about the responsibility of relieving the debt of others to forgiveness. Uh, and, uh, and so it's really very interesting that, you know, in those parables, it's usually about debt, about debt forgiven. That is a metaphor for forgiveness of people. And, uh, and so there's a relationship uh, in those, uh, you know, in those passages. Okay. Well, here in chapter 26 of Leviticus, uh, you have uh, really, it, it signals the end of the laws. The end of the, uh, in the context of Leviticus, the end of what people usually refer to as the holy laws. The laws, not, not about the sacrifices, but about uh, the way of the now, uh, uh, Ellie, a couple weeks ago, uh, uh, talked about, uh, you know, you shall be holy for I, the Lord, your God, am holy, in chapter 19. And about, uh, if we're going to be holy people, it doesn't just mean saying the right prayers at the right time. It means uh, uh, being a, a blessing to other, loving your neighbor as yourself. Uh, and, um, and so, at the end of this whole section, uh, you have chapter 26, which is kind of similar to the end of Deuteronomy uh, a little bit, where you read about blessings and curses, right? And um, uh, the idea in chapter 26 is an exhortation at the end that uh, obedience brings blessing, disobedience brings the opposite of blessing, or the absence of blessing, uh, or the curse. Uh, and and, uh, and so in the list, it's meant to be almost like a summary or proverbial, uh, like proverbial statements of, of this is the kind of thing that will happen if you obey. This is the kind of thing that will happen if you disobey, right? And so first, let's read here um, uh, the first... Uh, Maybe 13 verses of chapter 26. You shall not make for yourselves idols, nor shall you set up for yourselves an image or a sacred pillar, nor shall you place a figured stone in your land to bow down to it, I, for I am the Lord your God. You shall keep my Sabbaths and reverence my sanctuary. I am the Lord. So the, the very beginning is, you know, uh, you need to approach me in the right way. Almost the summary of the beginning of the Ten Commandments. But then he says this, if you walk in my statutes and keep my commandments so as to carry them out, then I shall give you rains in their seasons, 
so that the land will yield its produce, and the trees of the field will bear their fruit. Indeed, your threshing will last for you until grape gathering, and grape gathering will last until sowing time. You will thus eat your food to the full and live securely in your land. I shall also grant peace in the land, so that you may lie down with no one making you tremble. I shall also eliminate harmful beasts from the land, and no sword will pass through your land. But you will chase your enemies, and they will fall before you by the sword. Five of you will chase a hundred, and a hundred of you will chase ten thousand, and your enemies will fall before you by the sword. So I will turn toward you and make you fruitful and multiply. Always uh, a very important new phrase. And I will confirm my covenant with you. And you will eat the old supply and clear out the old because of the new. Moreover, I will make my dwelling among you, and my soul will not reject you. That's a very strong statement. You know, he's in God's soul, God's inner person, right? I will also walk among you and be your God, and you shall be my people. I am the Lord your God who brought you out of the land of Egypt so that you should not be their slaves. And I broke the bars of your yoke uh, and made you walk. So uh, there's certainly uh, a lot we could say. We'll talk more about it in our Torah study. But the point uh, that, that uh, a couple of little points uh, that I wanted to make here is that first, if you look at what happens, generally speaking, if you uh, obey, are the kinds of things that we read about in the prophets, about in the, the Messianic age. You know, the wolf will, will lay down with the lamb, a little boy will lead them, uh, the uh, earth will, uh, you know, the, the land will produce uh, fruitfulness, you'll be fruitful and multiply, you know, in that day. Uh, and uh, uh, it's very important for us, I think, to, uh, you know, to, to understand uh, that um, God's vision for this world has always been what you read about, like, you know, in the beginning of uh, Rashi, in the beginning of Genesis, in the Garden the garden of Eden. This, you know, you'll be fruitful and multiply. The land, you'll be fruitful. The land will be fruitful. You'll have great relationship with one another, and, you know, so on and so forth. Uh, and, uh, uh, and we know that because of uh, sinfulness uh, in this world, that uh, God did not destroy, they didn't take away the blessings, but they became kind of, they became difficult. Uh, they, they became uh, twisted, uh, you, you might say. It became very difficult to bear children, difficult to till, till the soil, and difficult to have human relationships. Uh, and, uh, and, but here we see, at the end of the day, uh, when God gives uh, Israel the Torah and he outlines how you should live it out, that lo and behold, there'll be a return to all that, you know, if you if you live this way. Okay. So it's important for us to to understand that what God is what He's not saying is that if you uh, if you jump through the right hoops, you'll be rewarded with, uh, with with these things. That if you if in other words, if you obey me, then I will reward you. You know, uh, when you read some different uh, kinds of uh, commentaries on this Jewish, yeah, that you get that idea that if, if I jump through the hoops, I, this is what I will do. But that is not what he is saying, because that is not the nature of the Torah. The Torah is not a bunch of laws uh, that are like a millstone around our neck to do. That's why we use the terminology, a Torah way of life, right? We like, to, we like to accentuate the rituals, but the vast majority of what the Torah is is about dignity and uh, treating people uh, you know, in a way that reflects the character uh, of God. Uh, and, uh, and so, uh, as I wrote in the Dirash, uh, that uh, just as God created the world, he created the world in a very orderly way, right? We would all say that. Created the world orderly. You have day, you have night, the moon, the, scar, the stars, the, the sky. Uh, we, we take in the exact 
uh, amount of oxygen that, that we need. The temperature is such that we can live here. We have water, food. God created it orderly with seasons, day and night, uh, and so on. Well, may I suggest that when he created uh, human beings, he did the same thing. He created us orderly. He created us with a way of to live a particular way of life uh, that he has ordained for human beings to live. And it is in such a way uh, that, uh, as we read in, in the Torah, that there is care and concern for one another. Uh, you know, uh, if you go all the way back to Cain and Abel, right, doesn't uh, Cain ask a particular question? Uh, it's kind of a rhetorical question. Uh, am I my brother's keeper? That's kind of like another way of saying, am I supposed to love my neighbor as myself? You know, so it goes all the way back to creation, the way of life that God gave us to live in the Torah. And when we when we live the way of life that God gave us as a, as a humanity, when we live that way, there is order to everything. We were called right at the beginning of Genesis to do what? Subdue the earth. To be the overseers, to be like God's subcontractors uh, uh, in terms of, of, of this uh, physical uh, world. And uh, there is a relationship between us living the way of life that God has ordained for us uh, and the well-being of the world. Right? Uh, and uh, it's quite clear from many passages of Scripture in the prophets that a large part of what's going to happen uh, in the what, what people refer to as the messianic age, when the Messiah is ruling from this world, that it's more than just us having a right relationship with God, that the entire, that us and the whole creation, the whole creation is in order. Is, uh, and uh, so, uh, for example, you read in uh, Isaiah, uh, chapter 11, right? uh, uh, in verse 6. And the wolf will dwell with the lamb, and the leopard will lie down with the kid, and the calf and the young lion and the fatling together, and a little boy will lead them. You know, every single term in that is like they're adversaries. Every single one, they're, they're natural adversaries, but there will be peace in the animal world and between people and those animals, a little boy will be there. It's very important. And the cow and the bear will graze. Their young will lie down together. The lion will eat straw like the ox. And the nursing child will play by the hole of the cobra. And the weaned child will put his hand on the viper's den. Wow! I mean, the visual of that is scary just thinking about it, right? But... What Isaiah is giving us is a vivid picture of shalom, of shalom in the world. Not just people, but even animals. Okay? All right. uh, and they will not hurt or destroy in all my holy mount, for the earth will be full of the knowledge of the Lord, and the waters will cover, uh, will cover the sea. So there, you know, we see that. Go to another place in Isaiah, chapter 35. By the way, isn't it interesting that the first uh, 39 chapters of Isaiah aren't all about the same story? Okay. In uh, chapter 35, uh, it says, uh, it's actually a continuation of chapter 34, but I can't read the whole book of Isaiah. Uh, in chapter 35, it says, The wilderness and the desert will be glad, and the Arabah will rejoice and blossom. Our, uh, the Arabah, or the Arabah, is deep down there in the Negev, where it looks like the surface of the moon. <laughs> okay. It will blossom profusely and rejoice with rejoicing and shout of joy. Uh, the glory of Lebanon will be given to it, the majesty of Carmel and Sharon. They will see the glory of the Lord, the majesty of our God. Isn't it interesting that the glory of God and shouting for joy and the land uh, producing are all kind of viewed as kind of all like the same thing. Encourage the exhausted and strengthen the feeble. Say to those with anxious heart, take courage, fear not. 
Behold, your God will come with vengeance. The recompense of God will come, but he will save you. Then the eyes of the blind will be opened, the ears of the deaf will be unstopped, the lame will leap like a deer, and the tongue of the dove will shout for joy, and waters will break forth in the wilderness and streams in the Arabah. Notice that the healing of people and the land is viewed as like all the same category. Yeah. Okay? And the scorched land will become a pool, and the thirsty ground springs of water, and the haunt of jackals its resting place. Grass becomes reed uh, and rushes. Well, I think and I think we get the idea. Uh, if we turn to one one other place, and that is, uh, this was uh, Eli's uh, Haftorah portion in the book of uh, Amos, at the very end of Amos, when we read about the restoration of the tabernacle of David, meaning when the Messiah comes and uh, restores the kingdom uh, of David in this world. Notice what it says here. In that, in verse 11 of chapter 9 of Amos, in that day I will raise up the fallen youth of David and wall up its breaches. I will also raise up its ruins and rebuild it as the days of old, that they may possess the remnant of Edom and all the nations who are called by my name, declares the Lord. And of course, uh, uh, that tells us, as well as in other passages, that the restoration is not only of Israel, but of the nations, and not only of the land of Israel, but of the, nation, of the land around the world. Behold, days are coming, declares the Lord, when the plowman will overtake the reaper, and the treader of grapes, so who, who, the treader of grapes, him who sows the seeds, when the mountains will drip sweet wine, and all the hills will be dissolved, and I will restore the captivity of my people Israel, and they will rebuild the ruined cities and live in them. They will also plant vineyards and drink their wine, and make gardens and eat their uh, and eat their fruit. I will also plant them on their land. And they will not again be rooted out of their land, which I have given them, says uh, says the Lord. Okay. And so when you go back to, to uh, Leviticus and you see what God will do uh, if uh, the people obey him, is he'll bring all this to pass. Because this was this is the vision that God had. When you read the Torah, really, when we're reading the I mean the, the nuts and bolts of the Torah laws, and the way of life, and, and all of that, we're really reading a vision statement of God's desire I, and, uh, I, and how important it is uh, you know, for us to understand that. Now, when you come to the book of Deuteronomy, uh, in Deuteronomy, well, actually, there's a couple of things. One is in uh, uh, chapter 7, it's continuing this thought. When you read here in uh, verse 12 of uh, Deuteronomy chapter 7, uh, it says uh, uh, here, uh, Then it will come about, because you listen to these judgments and keep and do them, that the Lord your God will keep with you his covenant and his loving kindness, his chesed, his loyal love, which he swore to your forefathers. And he will love you and bless you with, and multiply you. He will also bless the fruit of your womb and the fruit of your ground, your grain, your new wine, your oil, the increase of your herd, your young flock in the land which he swore to give to your forefathers, and so on and so forth. So clearly we, we see this all the way through. Uh, and, uh, and, and again, it's not, about, it's not about jumping through hoops. It is about living the way that God has called us to live. And that is why in the fourth chapter of uh, Deuteronomy, uh, we read uh, we read this about keeping keeping the the uh, the laws. So keep and do them, for that is your wisdom. Okay, that is your wisdom and your understanding in the sight of the peoples who will hear all these statutes and say, surely this great nation is a wise and understanding people. Isn't it interesting that it says, this is your wisdom. Live out the Torah way of life. This is wisdom. Right? Now, of course, in our writings course at MSI, we've learned some things about wisdom and its relationship to creation and the order of creation. That's another story for another day. But God created us to be a certain kind of people. That is a blessing to one another and a blessing to this earth and this uh, and uh, this uh, this world, 
Uh, and so the Torah, rather than being some kind of millstone around our neck, is wisdom. It is a blessing. And you know, in the Siddur, just before the uh, just before the um, the Shema, uh, there is uh, there there are several blessings just before the Shema, and one of them is called Ahavat Olam, Ahavat Olam Beit Yisrael Amcha Avta, with everlasting love you have loved uh, your people, the house of Israel, and then it goes on to say you have taught us Torah and commandments, decrees and laws of justice. Uh, and then at the end of it, it says, for they are our life. Speaking of the commandments, they are our life and the length of our days. Isn't that an amazing thing to say? They are our life. Uh, uh, it doesn't say they are the laws of the land. If we break them, we're really in big trouble. Uh, it says they are our life. It sounds a lot like, uh, by the way, Leviticus chapter 18, uh, the first uh, few verses there. For they are our life and the length of our days, and on them we meditate day and night. May you never take away your love from us. Love and the commandments, love, life, and commandments are all seen as kind of like the same thing. Isn't it amazing? May you never take away your love from us. Blessed are you, Lord, who loves his people Israel. And the primary way that he loves his people Israel, he's given us a way of life. This orderly way of life that is enriching, that is enduring, that is satisfying, that gives wholeness, uh, you know, and uh, and uh, meaning. So very important. Now, when you look at the end of the book of Deuteronomy, in the 29th chapter, Moses, who has now been with the people for all these years, 40 years, comes to the conclusion that this is really never going to happen unless God does something else. Because... Uh, there's no way that Israel is going to live this way of life in such a way to usher in all of these blessings, like this return to to Eden, this return to to Eden. For he says in chapter 29, in verse 4, Yet to this day the Lord has not given you a heart to know, nor eyes to see, nor ears to hear. He's given you the, the words but clearly not the ability to understand them and to live this out. Then the rest of Deuteronomy 29 explains the ramifications of that, of judgment, of having to ultimately, you'll go in the land, but you're going to forget about God and you're going to get exiled from the land. But remember, God still loves you, but this is what's going to happen, right? And then in chapter 30, he says, but you know, the day is going to come wherever you... Wherever you're exiled, you're going to remember God, you're going to return to him, and then God will bring you back to the land. And you know what's going to happen, it says in verse 6, Moreover, the Lord your God will circumcise your heart and the heart of your descendants to love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, in order that you may live. And so, of course, that's that sounds a lot like the Shema in Deuteronomy chapter 6. That's the... that's. When we love God completely with all of our being, a, a, ultimately, this is what, in the world, this is what will take place, all these uh, blessings. And so God says that's what, he's, that's what he will indeed uh, do. And so when we talk about the good news, a very important part of the good news is that God sent Yeshua to ensure that that vision for the future will come to pass, Right? And it begins, of course, with people as individuals embracing, uh, embracing uh, uh, the Messiah. Uh, and with, as we talk about, you know, uh, Shavuot uh, approaching, the pouring out of the Ruach, the promise of the fathers. We read in, uh, you know, Jeremiah chapter 31 uh, that the new covenant is God placing the Torah within us so that we will be empowered to live it, to, to live it. Uh, we read the same thing in Ezekiel chapter 36, right? Of the God placing his ruach within us and enabling us to live in his statutes and his uh, ordinances. Uh, and so uh, in, uh, you know, in Messiah Yeshua, uh, God has, uh, has given that to us. So, you know, it's very important, I think, for us to... Uh, 
to have that understanding. And if we go back again, just uh, uh, very uh, uh, quickly here in Leviticus chapter uh, 26, it is really very interesting uh, what we read uh, about what will uh, what will take place, right? So the earth will yield it will yield its produce. Uh, the um, uh, there'll be peace in the land, right? There'll be peace. I uh, uh, will be fruit. People will be fruitful and multiply. I uh, God will dwell among His people. In fact, the word is mishkan. <laughs> you know, the word there, my ta- my tabernacle will be among you, right? And my soul will not reject you. I will also walk among you. I, I mean, that is like uh, headlines, uh, you know, in big print. Uh, uh, it's a return to Eden uh, is, uh, is what this is. And I will be your God and you shall be my people. And he says, you see, this is why I brought you out of Egypt. I brought you out of Egypt so I will be your king and made you to walk upright. Made you to walk upright. Upright with confidence, knowing that you belong, you, you, you have returned to me and I will lead you, I, you know, uh, on this uh, journey so that uh, you will indeed fulfill, you will indeed fulfill your, your calling. Now, if you read the rest of the chapter, you see that the curses are the opposite, the opposite of the blessings. In other words, um, uh, you have uh, here that uh, the land will become unproductive. Uh, God h- will turn his favor toward other people. Uh, he'll set his face against them. Uh, uh, you know, uh, there'll be persecution uh, and, and terrible things will, uh, will happen. And, uh, and so uh, that's also very, very uh, interesting that there is this relationship between the sinfulness of humanity and uh, what happens on earth in the world with animals and the you know and, and the and the earth uh, indeed itself I um, uh, in you know in Jeremiah uh, chapter uh, chapter 2 and in chapter 3 in Jeremiah chapter 2 in verse 7 uh, we read I brought you into the fruitful land to eat its fruit and its good things. But you came and defiled my land, uh, and my inheritance made you uh, an, an abomination. Okay? That's very interesting. My inheritance made you an abomination. Uh, what is that? Inher- that inheritance is the land. It made you an abomination uh, because there is a relationship between the between the defilement of humanity and the defilement of the land. He says it again, by the way, in chapter 3, and there's tons of other places where we read this uh, as well. But in chapter 3, in verses 2 and 3, lift up your eyes to the bare heights and see where you have not, where have you not been violated? By the road you have sat for them like an Arab in the desert, and you have polluted a land with your harlotry and with your wickedness. Therefore, the showers have been up withheld, and there has been no spring rain. Yet you have a harlot's forehead. You refuse to be ashamed. So there is this relationship with the land suffering. I even have an old note that I wrote in, in the, uh, you know, in the margin of my Bible that the land suffers. The land suffers. Uh, and now we have to be careful of that, of going around uh, saying, well, every natural disaster is because these people did something. <laughs> you know, we have to be very careful of that, you know, that, that kind of thing. Who are we to say? Who are we to say that? But in the big scheme of things, I, what you have is the earth groans over the sinfulness of humanity. Oh, doesn't that sound very much like something that we read in the New Covenant in the 8th chapter of the book of Romans. In Romans chapter 8, we read in verse 22, For we know that the whole creation groans and suffers the pains of childbirth together until now. And not only this, but we, but also we ourselves, having the first fruits of the Spirit, even we ourselves groan within ourselves, waiting eagerly for our adoption as sons, 
the redemption of our, of our body. For in hope we have been saved, but hope that is seen is not hope. For why does one also hope for what he sees? For if we hope for what we do not see, with perseverance we eagerly wait for it. Uh, and so how important it is that uh, we, uh, we certainly uh, have a message of good news, of good news for this world, that God has given us an alternative way of life that brings well-being and ultimately the redemption of the entire created, the entire uh, a created world. You know, the uh, the mystery is is that this uh, kingdom of God uh, is uh, inaugurated and established, but in the midst of the darkness. But the day will come when the light will indeed, you know, overtake the darkness. So so certainly uh, there is uh, there is hope and. So what should we do? What is our, what is our calling in this? Well, our, our calling is to live in such a way, live in this orderly way of life that God has given us, live this Torah way of life that God has given us amongst ourselves to be a testimony of, of a way of life. Uh, and, uh, uh, and, you know, recognize that there is a real reality to uh, what we call the good news. And uh, to indeed uh, look forward to uh, to the redemption of the uh, the redemption of the world. And so, uh, you know, as we are completing counting the Omer, and as we come towards Shavuot, you know, there's a there's a lot of ways we can view this this period, this 50 uh, day period. One is the historic, you know, uh, remembering uh, leaving Egypt and getting to Mount Sinai and receiving the Torah. Uh, another is uh, uh, remembering the, um, the the resurrection of Yeshua and getting to uh, Pentecost in Acts chapter two. Another way to look at it is like our whole life, and that the the counting begins when I've embraced Yeshua, you know. And now it's Lord, teach me to count my days that I might present to you a heart of wisdom, you know. And that it's a metaphor for just our whole life, but we need to always remember that. You know, there is a day, there is an end to this life, not just my life, but there'll be a day to the end of suffering. There is a day that is coming when all of what we read here will, you know, will indeed come to pass. And that's where our hope is. And that's what causes us to live in such a way that we can stay above the fray and, and overcome uh, the great difficulties of this life, knowing what indeed the future holds, this great vision uh, that God has given us. And when we live this orderly way of life uh, God has given us, we can begin to experience, we can taste and see that the Lord is good. And remember that when David said, taste and see that the Lord is good, he was running away from Saul for his life. Things were not good when he said, taste and see that the Lord is good. But he knew that there was indeed a future. And he could continue to live well in the midst of it. But, uh, you know, there is this, um, this uh, uh, passage that we read um, about here in... Um, Isaiah chapter 25 uh, here. When you talk about what does the future hold, it says here, He will swallow up death for all time. The Lord God will wipe away tears from all faces. He will remove the reproach of His people from all the earth. The Lord has spoken. It will be said on that day, Behold, this is our God for whom we have waited, that He might save us. This is the Lord for whom we have waited. Let us rejoice and be glad in his deliverance, not only Israel, but indeed the world. And so may we be people who carry that message. May we be people who pray, who draw on the power of God, who find our, our refuge and our strength uh, in him. And as we stay close uh, to the uh, Lord, we can, in the midst of great trial and difficulty, good times and bad times, we can indeed uh, experience a taste of this. Like Paul says, yet even, even though we groan, 
we can taste it and uh, live in it. And uh, we'll just close with this great statement from the prophet Habakkuk uh, about, uh, about the future, about the vision. For the vision is yet for the appointed time. It hastens toward the goal and it will not fail. Though it tarries, wait for it, for it surely will come. It will not delay. But in the meantime, the proud one, his soul's not right within him. But the righteous will live faithfully. And so let us wait with assurance. Let us know that, uh, uh, that this is a promise uh, that will not fail. It will come completely in God's time. But in the meantime, may we walk faithfully. May we fulfill our calling. And therefore, may we have shalom in our lives, a uh, uh, well-being, satisfaction, a sense of meaning and significance. Uh, and uh, may, uh, may people see it and be drawn to its pain. Lord uh, uh, God, thank you, God, that for the great promises that you have to give us. Lord, thank you, God, for Yeshua, our Messiah, who came to ensure that this future would come. For without him, there's no way. There's no way we could, we could live it out. There's no way that uh, we would be able on our own to, be, to receive uh, this blessing. And so, God, may we realize that we all have a calling in Messiah Yeshua to live a, in such a way uh, that uh, brings uh, uh, that that brings new life, that brings uh, uh, well-being. May we live in a manner worthy of the calling, Lord. And uh, God, may we indeed uh, experience uh, that uh, that taste, uh, as uh, as uh, Henry uh, would say, the, a taste of hidden man, uh, Lord, a taste of uh, your future for us. Thank you. You have not left us to our own devices, but you have indeed broken into this world and have ensured its future in Messiah. Thank you.